Welcome to the UK Investor Magazine podcast, the latest on shares, markets and investments, now available on your Amazon Alexa. Hello and welcome to the UK Investor Magazine podcast, now also available on the UK Investor Magazine mobile app. For today's podcast, we'll be taking a deep dive into the next energy solar fund investment trust. So we're going to be looking at some of the main developments this year and the attractions for investors. And to do that, we're very kindly joined today by Stephen Rosser, who is the investment director and UK counsel for the Next Energy Solar Fund. Stephen, thank you very much for being on the podcast today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we, we get into the depths of the trust, uh, Stephen, it would be good if we could set the scene, please, with a brief introduction, first of all, to yourself, but as well as the investment trust, please. Really happy to do so. So, uh, yes, as you've mentioned, uh, I'm the investment director and also UK counsel at Next Energy Capital in the UK. We are the investment advisor uh, and investment manager for Next Energy Solar Fund. Uh, my job day to day is to look after all of the business of Next Energy Solar Fund. So that's everything from you know, the operation of the solar plants that we have within the portfolio through to the growth of that portfolio and the investments we make to drive shareholder value. That obviously work very closely with uh, a, a very specialist uh, team at Next Energy Capital to deliver all of that. Uh, and we're very proud this year for Next Energy Solar Fund to have celebrated our 10th year anniversary uh, and 10 years of uh, of a progressive dividend as well. So uh, a really, really strong track record there. And that, that's one thing that we are going to discuss in some detail later on in the podcast, Stephen, it is the dividend. It's a very attractive dividend. And as you said, a progressive dividend policy there. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the dividend later on. But I think it would be good to start with looking at the, the macro picture, looking at the macro perspective, of course, operating in, in solar, we're going to be discussing uh, the portfolio and, and the assets. But to start with, I, th I think it'd be good if we could take a step back and, and look at the factors that are supporting solar at the moment. So, so when you're sitting, Stephen, what, what are the main drivers supporting shareholder returns in solar assets at the moment? I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And the, the way I like to think of it is across five main dimensions. Um, happily, they all start with P. So we'll, we'll just sort of step through <laughs> They are uh, their policy popularity, uh, proven technology, pricing, and most importantly, right now, potential. Um, so just, I mean, if I just step through those in um, very brief, very briefly. So in the UK, from a policy perspective, particularly since the election, but uh, but even before uh, the most recent general election, a very clear uh, ambition to achieve uh, net zero and a very clear ambition to uh, roll out uh, solar across the UK as, as part of that uh, energy transition. Um, and it's been really pleasing to see the commitment that the uh, the incoming government has shown to driving that agenda at pace. Uh, so we've got some, I think, incoming additional or incremental targets around 2030, um, which I'm sure we'll come to hear about in weeks ahead uh, from the Solar Task Force and, uh, and other initiatives that are going on. We've obviously seen the government uh, in, enhance the CFD budget uh, since since taking office, uh, which has really helped with uh, early stage deployment of some, some new projects. Um, we've also seen approaching two gigawatts of uh, solar projects being consented through the uh, the NSIP programme uh, since the government has taken, taken office. So, you know, very clear commitment and, and direction of travel, which I think all goes well for for the future in, in the sense of the, of the government setting out its stall very clearly. From a popularity perspective, just moving on, what I mean by that is, is you know, broad public support. Obviously, there are uh, localised areas of, of objection. There always are with anything in, in the planning system, whatever uh, one is developing. But on the whole, public support for, uh, for solar projects and solar farms particularly is actually amongst the highest, if not the highest, of all the renewable generating technologies uh, and we've you know we've seen that borne out through a variety of independent studies as well conducted over the last uh, last few years um it's been really interesting to see you know as an operator of a, of a, of a uh, portfolio of 102 assets the vast majority of which are in the uk really interesting to see how that changes as well through the life cycle of a, of a solar farm so 
even where one does experience uh, sort of pockets of localized objection through the initial planning phases, once the plant is constructed and operating, actually what we see is that they're very quickly adopted into the local community as a, as a local amenity. And quite a lot of our uh, solar farms are used, or the perimeters of them used by you know, dog walkers and the like. Um, you know, and they sort of fit into you know, the landscape and, and everyday way of life. So it's, um, you know, they, they are uh, generally very, very well supported um, around the country, which is really important. Um, the third of the third of the five P's is is a proven technology. So, I mean, I'd started in this industry, um, you know, when solar was in its infancy. Um, it's super exciting today to be able to talk about solar as being a mainstream, mature technology, um, and uh, with everything that that uh, with everything that that brings. So, we've learned a huge amount over the last certainly fifteen odd years in this country, uh, you know, and, and more beyond. Uh, internationally in terms of how to deploy and optimize these assets effectively um, to drive uh, returns for shareholders uh, and investors generally. Um, the fourth is pricing. Um, so in the last 10 years, the, the cost of solar PV components has come down by about 90%, which is enormous really. Um, precipitated by some initial momentum created through sort of subsidy, subsidy support to drive uh, scale and, and economies of scale and drive deployment. Um, but I think we are uh, very well placed today to be able to deploy quickly. And, and solar now is the, is the cheapest and uh, quickest to deploy of all of the renewable generating uh, technologies, um, which really, really plays in its favour as, we, uh, as we focus on that transition to net zero. And then the last P is potential. So I think we've got about 16 gigawatts of solar on the system right now. We're targeting uh, 70 gigawatts as part of a net zero transition. So there's a huge amount to go after. And over those 10 years uh, with, the, with the module prices and the other component prices having come down, what we've also seen is a huge uh, acceleration in the capacity and the efficiency of the modules um, particularly so that we could install, for example, plant of the same capacity in somewhere between a third and half the footprint of, a, of one of the original solar farms, which is very exciting for a portfolio like Next Energy Solar Funds um, as we think to the future and think about how we repower those assets over, over time and the capacity that we can install uh, as those assets come to the, uh, the natural point of their their life and are ready to be uh, to be repowered. The alternative way of thinking about that is that we could install you know the same capacity as we currently have using less space, leaving space therefore to do some of the good work we do or some more of the good work we do around natural capital, for example, in terms of the way we use that surrounding land, uh, or maybe even deploying uh, co-located energy storage, for example. Um, so a huge amount of opportunity and potential uh, there as well. So I'd say the, you know, those are the, the, the main macro factors really creating the positivity around uh, solar as we sit here today. Thank you. So I just want to look at the, you know, the, the comparison with the UK to, to overseas, because, of course, Next Energy Solar Fund predominantly focused on the UK, although you do have some some assets overseas. Yeah. And you've outlined there very kindly and comprehensively. Thank you, Stephen. The, the benefits of uh, operating solar plants in the UK. But what does that look, look like overseas? I mean, is the UK a real front runner in this area? Are you seeing any other jurisdictions which have as favourable environments for solar assets or, or is really, you know, the, the UK the place to be for solar at the moment? I think it's uh, it's a constantly evolving picture. Um, and and the, the way one would answer it, thinking about um, there are a multitude of different factors, irradiance being one. So, um, you know, brighter jurisdictions, you, you might drive more um, more generation from your assets, but also that comes with increased temperatures, which ultimately um, reduce the asset efficiency. So the UK is somewhere in a, uh, I'd, I'd say, a, a Goldilocks zone in terms of uh, the balance of irradiation and temperatures, because it's not 
it's not sunlight uh, as in sunshine. It's it's the it's um it's a radiant light uh, that the that the modules use. So actually, the amount of um, fluctuation that you see year in year out in terms of the amount of irradiation that the UK experiences is pretty stable. Um, maybe a percentage point here or there, up or down year to year, different to diff to to other types of generating assets um, like wind, for example, which can see swings of you know up to forty percent year on year. So pretty pretty stable in that sense. Um, but also, I would I, I think we've done a huge amount of work with the grid and the regulation and and. Um, the sort of policy environment in the UK, which has positioned us as a front runner um, relative to other jurisdictions. Um, obviously, what we're experiencing on the grid system right now is congestion because you know everybody can see the benefit of deployment, um, and we aren't able to build the grid infrastructure quickly enough to uh, to be able to deploy the assets that we want to and, and need to all around the country. Uh, to achieve our net zero ambitions, a huge amount of uh, focus amongst government and others uh, to really uh, drive through change in that uh, in that space. Um, but you know, I think other other jurisdictions and other geographies are, in a sense, you know, playing catch up. They've got their own versions of that. Their grid infrastructure will, you know, have have evolved in different ways and at different times, and their regulatory systems work in in different ways. So they're very different markets. What we have uh, in the UK, and, and the reason it's attractive here particularly, is that fundamentally it is it is pretty stable. It's very predictable. It's relatively low risk uh, compared to uh, some of the other jurisdictions. <clears throat> so, in terms of long term predictable uh, returns and performance, the UK is a remains a really attractive destination. Fantastic. Um made some some fascinating points there especially the the one about that the variation uh, year on year in the amount produced because i'm sure some people would think that you know gi given the the cloudy nature of of the uk that uh you know that that would have an impact so that's a, that's a particularly interesting point so Stephen, there, there's a, there's over 100 sites at the moment and, and this is a question really towards the the growth plans for uh, for next energy with those sites you have there, do you foresee more sites coming online? Are you expanding? Are there plans to expand the existing ones? Where, where does the, the growth come from for Next Energy going forward? I think that the short answer is, is yes, absolutely. We foresee growth and that growth can come from internally within the existing assets Um uh, also from the proprietary development pipeline that we have within uh, within the fund, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, you know, and also, you know, from from the third party market as that that evolves uh, and particularly as the as the capital environment uh, evolves around us over the uh, weeks and months ahead. But um, so within within the portfolio, I briefly touched on the concept of repowering assets as they Either come to the end of their useful life, or or at a, a point where it makes sense to to repower them, and there is huge potential uh, to increase the capacity of the existing assets, or you know, co-locate them with storage um, uh, as, uh, as ways of driving uh, ways of driving growth. Although, admittedly, that that wouldn't increase the number of sites per se uh, on its own. Um, but uh, as Next Energy Capital, on behalf of Next Energy Solar Fund, we have worked really hard to build a proprietary uh, pipeline within the fund itself, um, which uh, so the fund you know, owns the rights to uh, a variety of solar and uh, energy storage projects um, of around 500 million of capital deployment potential, you know, sitting there ready to go when the uh, when the capital environment is is uh, right and, and ready for um, for us to deploy uh, those projects. Um, so we can really, uh, you know, so we're really primed to drive that growth uh, for the fund. The uh, an, another source of growth is the is Next Energy Group's development platform, which is called Starlight. So that has a uh, pipeline of around ten gigawatts of uh, renewable uh, projects all around the world. Um, 
and for qualifying to the relevant assets, Next Energy Solar Fund has a right of first offer um, in respect of Starlight projects. Um, so, you know, uh, not within the fund, but definitely uh, first access to, you know, another source of uh, attractive, exciting pipeline, all of which before you get to um, you know, the fact that actually there is still a pretty bright and vibrant third party market for either existing assets or new projects. Um, which uh, we could uh, and, and are excited or will be excited to deploy capital into um, when the uh, when the environment is right to do so. Thank you. So moving on now, Stephen, I believe uh, at the beginning of this year, you've uh, undertaken a capital recycling program, which which I'd like to touch on because it's it's particularly interesting. So, you know, first of all, you know, there's going to be people listening to this and may not be aware of it. So, you know, f first up, please, please could you explain you know, what this is and the, uh, the, the methods that you're employing uh, within this and, and the end goal. And also, if we could bring in the interest rate environment as well and, and, and maybe uh, provide some context as to what the, the programme could be doing or how would that develop if we start to see rates fall a little bit further than, than what we're seeing at the moment. Yes, uh, of course. So, I mean, the cornerstone here is that Next Energy Capital is an active and, and a very proactive uh, manager of these investments. Um, so as the, the capital raising environment evolved uh, around us, um, what we uh, realised we, we needed to look at very carefully was how we would put Next Energy Solar Fund in a position where it could drive its own growth from, from within by thinking really intelligently about how and where capital is deployed. Uh, we have a very disciplined capital allocation policy and the combination of uh, of that work and thinking resulted in, in us announcing to the market that we would initiate a, a programme to recycle capital out of some existing investments uh, to down pay against our revolving credit facility, which is a, a facility that we use to drive growth for the vehicle between equity raises, um, creating effectively headroom uh, capacity to you know, make uh, make other value accretive investments where those uh, opportun opportunities present themselves. Um, so we put together a portfolio of assets um, which were we put them together for, for a number of, or um, the rationale for putting them together was, was driven by a number of different reasons. The the first of which was uh, accessing or, um, the you know the pockets of you know dry powder that we could see in the market, uh, particularly where um, you know we could see that you know, um, investors were hoping to deploy capital into new projects, but being delayed or constrained by congestion on the on the grid. Um, and you know being able to deploy into newly built assets which had effectively run that gauntlet and, and all of the uncertainties that have been taken away uh, attractive for that uh, community so you know, that's one of the drivers um the, an, another is that you know as we were um as we were talking to investors there are always always questions around the um, net asset value of the fund and how that is compiled you know one of the ways that one can demonstrate the uh, the integrity and the prudence of that uh, of the net asset value calculation that we do on a quarterly basis is to uh, realize investments in some of the assets you know in line with or ideally um, favorably to to that that nav uh, which is what we've done so we have completed uh, two phases of the capital recycling uh, program so far the first of which was a development project uh, called Happerden. Um, where we will manage to achieve a, a, a multiple of two times on the invested capital, um, which was uh, really important for, for the fund. A um, few different ways we achieved that, including optimising the design of the site, so that uh, whereas it had been originally conceived as a 50 megawatt project, we were able to sell it as a 60 megawatt project with uh, development rights for battery storage uh, and also a CFD really, really driving value there for uh, for investors. Uh, the second phase of the capital recycling program was a project called White Cross, um, which completed in um, around June this year, 
um, again, sold at a premium to our net asset, net asset value of around 14%. Um, again, really uh, tapping into you know where where we saw the um, uh, the capital in the market looking to deploy. The remaining phases of the of that program, uh, I can't say too much about them. They remain in competitive third party processes, and we will continue to to bring them forward uh, in a diligent fashion, as you would expect of uh, of, an, of a proactive asset manager like us. Thank you. Really interesting points that you made there. Stephen, you know, there is, there is a discount to NAV uh, at that moment. If you look at the share price of, of Next Energy Solar Fund, you know, that has been narrowing over over the year. Uh, but the points that you make there, that when you actually go to market with, with these assets, it's clear that the public markets at this moment are, are undervaluing uh, Next Energy's uh, portfolio there. Um, as I said, that, ha that has been narrowing uh, over this year, but I do want to just pick up on on the NAV because the most recent set of results that there was a very very minor uh, re reduction in NAV, but it's more about a, a question about the the future and what you see uh, driving NAV growth going forward from this point. So I think the uh, I mean, it's an excellent point. I think that the, you know, the key drivers of NAV. Um, uh, you know, we work very carefully um, to make sure that we are you know, wherever possible not taking management views and we take external data sources um, for things like inflation and uh, interest rate projections, which influence discount rate, uh, but also uh, power price uh, curves, um, you know, and how those how those then factor into the, the forward view of the cash flows. It's very, uh, it's a very robust process, and as you can imagine, it's uh, audited uh, very, uh, very rigorously um, uh, through sort of multiple, uh, multiple means to give us a you know, real sense of confidence that, you know, that the nav we have uh, with, across the portfolio is is robust. And as I mentioned, those sort of data points from external market transactions and our own transactions, you know, really support, uh, really support all of that. The um, in, you know, in terms of driving nav growth, I think it's back to all of the you know, the potential that uh, I, I talked about earlier on. You know, with that proprietary pipeline that we have within the platform, the ability we have uh, to you know grow the value of each of the individual assets uh, over over, uh, over time. Um, let's say whether that's through repowering or through um, co-location with energy storage or you know just other you know intelligent uh, work that we do across the uh, across the portfolio to you know, to drive their value incrementally for for investors so uh, all of all of which um you know very important uh, discount rates uh, as you'll appreciate have a significant bearing on on um on the nav and coming back to your earlier question about you know, the impact of interest rates, particularly on the capital recycling program, is the context in which you ask it, but also relevant in the context of the of the um of the, the NAV and particularly discount rates. I think that is where we will start to see some more um, positive impact uh, favorably for for the fund uh, from a number of different perspectives as we start to see interest rates uh, normalize. I don't expect that we'll see them go back to the you know, the, the, the historic lows that uh, that we'd experienced um, you know before the recent uptake, uh, but certainly as they as they settle out over the next twelve to eighteen months, what we should see uh, is that driving positive growth in the net asset value, but it should also mean that the um, uh, the, the market and, and liquidity of the of the shares and the appetite for capital to to come back into the sector um, should uh, should come back because it'd be fundamentally you know these are you know physical assets and in next energy solar funds they're performing exactly as we would want and expect them uh, to uh, the the revenues that we have are sort of cornerstoned by subsidies so we've got high degrees of of predictability um, and and fundamentally the you know as we said the discount to the uh, share price as a share price discount to the net asset value is it sort of unju unjustified from the perspective of the portfolio that we have but we understand it in the context of that sort of wider macroeconomic environment and as that starts to settle out you'd expect to see uh, expect to see all of that recover 
So the work that we're doing across the uh, across the investment manager and investment advisor is all about putting the fund in the best position we can to really accelerate uh, its growth when uh, you know when when markets uh, turn and are, and are able to support us in in driving that. Yeah, so it, it, it seems like there's a number of factors at play there, which are really going to be supportive of that now going forward, especially if we see lower lower interest rates. Another factor that I just want to move on to now, Stephen, is one of your your P's uh, from from the beginning, and and it's policy, and and you know looking at that at the change in government that we've seen to to the new Labour government, and and you, you did did explain. At the beginning about what what it meant for the trust, but I just want to elaborate on that and you know just look at you know that that change from a Conservative government to a Labour government. You know, is that a material change for for Next Energy Solar Fund? Do you see any real tailwinds from the the new agenda that we're seeing from the Labour government? Perhaps not additional tailwinds. Um, it would be very easy to think that they they weren't there before. I think that the thing that's different now post election is the the tone and the rhetoric is 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 very different, um, and the the sort of demonstration of commitment and particularly a demonstration of commitment to trying to get to some clarity. So that uh, you know, investors can have the confidence that you know that the environment isn't going to to change around the uh, around us all uh, as things evolve. So you know, we we what we see is you know high degree of consistency um, from um, you know previous administration to current administration in terms of the you know the size and scale of ambition. Um, not without its challenges, and those are, you know, sort of common and unrecognised, uh, particularly in terms of grid. Um, we see, you know, that there is, you know, pretty clear focus on on trying to tackle all of those things. Um, but you know, current administration's desire to talk about it that in a way that is, you know, clear, consistent, you know, sets out a, a deliverable pathway. Um, and he, you know, almost provides that confidence that that's the direction we are as a country heading in. You know, has uh, you know has definitely been welcome. Um, we're expecting some uh, important announcements over the uh, weeks and months ahead in terms of the shape of GB Energy, for example, which I think will be quite a complementary vehicle um, for wider net zero transition. Although although fundamentally not focused on mature technologies like like solar so you know we hope it will be supportive but not uh, not disruptive for us um the solar task force uh, i gather that will be uh, releasing uh, its uh, its reports over the coming weeks ahead setting out some ambitious and actionable targets as as well all of which just creating that um sort of public narrative that that is clear about the direction we're heading the you know, the ambition that we have as a country the case for investment um and you know providing all of those uh, reasons to be you know be positive and excited about the future for solar in the UK and and from our perspective particularly for for next energy solar fund thank you so m- moving on to to the final point here and and in my view uh, one of the biggest attractions of, of, of course, the the, the dividend, uh, progressive dividend policy. There, I believe, the current yield is is around ten percent, just over. Could we speak, Stephen, about that? You know, the policy there, the driver behind the dividend increases. How and you know, really, how that is set to impact shareholder returns going forward you know the, the influences that are happening within the the assets this progressive policy that you have does that look like it's it remains supportive going forward and i, I believe you you have a, a dividend target cover as well so if you could just touch on that as well that'd be fantastic please yeah so the dividend target for uh, this financial year is 8.43p um which is an increase on on uh, prior year um, ultimately, the, the, the dividend is a decision of the uh, independent board of directors. Um, we obviously work very closely with them to um, to, to map out uh, what makes sense uh, from an investor's perspective, but also from a you know how we drive uh, how we sort of 
deploy all of our capital um, to drive the you know the growth and best value for for investors. Um, you know, we're very proud of having a progressive policy and having a ten year track record of having increased the dividend uh, that we pay to shareholders. Um, and and that it's cash covered. Uh, you know that's that's a really important uh, component of, uh, of of the way forward. Um, so you know we we see that continuing um, as we talk to some of our more institutional investors. It's been interesting over the last uh, last while to you know hear the transition more towards a total shareholder return play, and that is particularly true given where the share prices currently relative to the NAV. And, and as I say, we, we see that as being an unjustified discount and, and therefore there is uh, there is potential uh, or significant potential there for um, you know for, for that growth um, in, in share price as, as part of a total return uh, play as well. So um, yeah, we you know a positive outlook. Um, we um, uh, yeah we, we would just retain our focus on on delivering uh, delivering that for investors. Thank you very much. Just a, a quick note to listeners: do check out the the UK Investor Magazine website and and the Investment Trust Centre, where you'll be able to see Next Energy Solar Funds page and get all of their latest commentary, um, fact sheets, uh, reports, uh, and such like, as well as some some recorded. Uh, presentations that we did earlier on this year we want to deeper dive uh, into the trust so Stephen thank you very much for being with us today that's my pleasure thanks for having me and thank you very much to everyone for listening thank you we hope you enjoyed listening to the UK Investor Magazine podcast please do share the podcast and we really value any reviews and comments you leave us in your chosen podcast player The views presented by the hosts and guests of the UK Investor Magazine podcast are in no way investment advice. And please remember, all investment involves risk.